Good evening. Uh, it's a pleasure and a privilege uh, to introduce today uh, Julia Salaski. Uh, Julia, as uh, Maria has uh, mentioned before, uh, she's an entrepreneur, uh, she is a lawyer. He, um, so pr probably her profile is particularly relevant for the University of Law Business School, from which I am the director, because she's probably in the middle of law and business. So play in that space, that particular space where law meets business and business meets law. So uh, at some early point in her career, she decided to change uh, and uh, embrace probably her profession from a different perspective and become a, a facilitator, entrepreneur, and uh, provide uh, other lawyers and uh, people uh, needing uh, resources uh, from, from that, uh, particularly from the resources that they need to for the professions and for they have access to the, to the legal system. Um, Julia was uh, previously uh, uh, lawyer, as I said, in Link Laters and the United Nations. Um, when she led uh, the work uh, with online dispute resolution, and in particular published on the topic of uh, digital solutions to consumer legal legal issues. Uh, from that uh, uh, career, early career in, in law, uh, she decided to move uh, and uh, to found uh, legal. Uh, legal is uh, an award-winning software uh, giving law firms the tools to succeed in digital world, um, which is not an easy thing to do. Uh, we know the, 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 the industry we are and uh, definitely it's, it's always challenging, uh, but there's something changing out there and uh, Julia thought it would be a very good opportunity for her to pioneer uh, one of these uh, companies and one of these uh, software um, tools. Um, so that software suit it covers all kind of aspects from digital client onboarding to more convenient payment options. Um, there's also another project, for, uh, another program from uh, legal, which is Crowd Justice, uh, which has been praised for its innovative legal funding model. They they try to get uh, funds for people needing to have access to to justice, and uh, they need the, those resources, and they, they are there to facilitate that. Uh, and, um, Julia has been recognized as the Financial Times uh, Legal Innovator of the Year. Uh, she's one of the the Brett's more influential people in law. Uh, she has been Legal Week's Outstanding Legal in Innovator of the Year and uh, City AM's Digital Innovator Power List. And uh, she has also been uh, named Marie Claire as a future, future chamber. So um, uh, needless to say, she's a University of Law uh, LPC graduate, so uh, an alumna from our institution. Uh, so Julia, I, I'm sure that the audience uh, and myself are eager to know more about your, your business and what you do. So would you please uh, tell us in more detail? Absolutely, thanks for the very generous introduction and thanks to everyone for, for coming. It's a, real, it's a real honor to be here, so thank you. Um, yeah, just in terms of a brief a brief overview, and Andres gave a gave a comprehensive one, but but I'll I'll be brief, and and then hopefully we can dig into areas that might be might be of interest to um, to everyone on the call. Um, but yeah, about five years ago, I started a business called Crowd Justice. Um, the idea was really I left the UN, was working as Andres mentioned on this idea of online dispute resolution. And we were working really at a macro macro level, 150 government lawyers from all over the world to try and create a solution that would help consumers resolve disputes online cross border. And um, it didn't, it just like didn't get very far. And that's because as you might imagine having 150 lawyers from 150 different different jurisdictions trying to agree on something related to technology is probably not the best starting place. But I was going out to California um, quite frequently to try and get people involved in building online dispute resolution systems um, to come to our sessions and to try and inform us and educate us on, on how building technology products worked on the ground. And I started to get really excited by that. And I saw this opportunity to try and build something. Um, and that's where Crowd Justice started. And the idea of Crowd Justice is really a, a platform. So um, it's a crowdfunding platform and it tries to facilitate people who need access to funding, getting access to funding by leveraging the crowd. Um, 
that's been that that's generated a lot of money for a lot of really important legal matters and one of the most interesting things about it um, and one and the evolution of legal the business i now run is that we work really closely at crowd justice with hundreds of law firms so funds raised through the platform go directly to lawyers client accounts and we automated compliance on those funds we still automate compliance on those funds and firms receive the payment digitally up front and we started to see that the real value proposition of, of crowd justice wasn't necessarily just what I had initially conceived of it as, which was a real consumer facing platform that could really increase the ability of consumers to get access, but also a way for lawyers to, um, to receive funds, to, to generate revenue, to bring on clients they might not otherwise be able to bring on. And I started to see that there was this huge adjacent opportunity because in crowd justice, which services a reasonably narrow part of the market, we're facilitating funding digitally upfront and, and compliantly. And actually, law firms typically don't receive funds digitally. They, they don't have um, necessarily automated compliance processes or streamlined approaches to you know, maintaining better cash flow, for example. And so the, the nugget of an idea for legal was born. And about a year ago, um, with our existing crowd justice team, we expanded into this into this um, parent company legal and what legal does is it's a SaaS product which effectively as Andres mentioned tries to help firms run their businesses more digitally more efficiently whilst critically giving their clients a better experience and that's something that I think has been coming to legal gradually the legal industry gradually over the the last few years I think there was an acceleration of that pre-COVID, this idea of adopting um, more digital ways of operating, but COVID has certainly accelerated that. So that's the nutshell version, but looking forward to explore in, in different areas in, in more detail. So thank you, uh, Julia. Uh, let, let's start with the, with the beginning. So you, you were a lawyer, a successful lawyer, if you allow me. You work in Linklaters, uh, United Nations, so it's amazing. At some point, you make a decision. Um, how was that process? So what, what was your motivation? What did you feel that uh, you thought that you could contribute? Um, there were a combination of, um, of factors and just, you know, if, if anyone on the call is thinking of making, making the jump from law to a more entrepreneurial profession, I can, I was very naive when I made that jump and I almost, you know, thank God that I was very naive for, for, um, at that time because it's, you know, it was something where I thought, I'll take a sabbatical from the UN for a year. I'll see, um, I'd love to just, I'd love to try to build something. And um, at first the UN is very, uh, you know, as, as it is the stereotype, it is a very bureaucratic organization and they really struggled to give me um, this year off. Um, in, in fact, I tried to quit and they said, no, you have to take it as a sabbatical. And I was like, okay, I don't, I don't actually really want to take it as a sabbatical. I want to, I want to just dive right in with both feet. And um, I, I fundamentally, I thought, you know, if I if I'm constrained by this idea that I could go back to something that's like reasonably cushy, that's that's reasonably easy, then it would be too hard for me to put everything into this project. Um, so I, I, having done a really quite complex negotiations in order to leave my job, um, I managed to forego the the sabbatical piece and. I time box six months and I thought I have enough savings I can go for six months to just try and, and build this project. And I really thought of it as a project. I initially I got a job working three or four days a week somewhere else and, and tried to build crowd justice up on the side. And there were a couple of things that, that really triggered the move to full time. And one was that um, it was I met a 22 year old um, this guy who was 22, who had an idea that he was working on that was in the same consumer legal industry, but it was, um, I, th I thought it was a less good idea than mine, but he was so arrogant and so excited by his idea and every small objection that I threw at him, he was like, I'll figure something out. And I just thought, ah, if I took that slightly more arrogant, slightly more bashing through obstacles approach and was less timid about just doing it, then perhaps it would be more likely to be successful. And the second thing was that I just, the more that I got into the meat of the idea, the more I thought there was potentially something there and, and it was synergistic with, with this idea of throwing everything into it and just seeing what stuck. So 
the the naivete w- was really about i had no i had no long term roadmap i had no sort of plan what success really looked like in 6 months i i just thought i'll give it 6 months and see but i don't think at that point i had a really clear view as to what the end of that period might look like mm-hmm. thank you um May I ask you, uh, what did you expect to achieve at uh, not just a professional, but also as a, at a personal level? So uh, you know that sometimes when you ask entrepreneurs, they, they mention a variety of things, uh, a variety of aims. Uh, it may be uh, style, uh, living style, uh, maybe just the, 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 the aim to succeed, uh, as, you, as you mentioned before, to su- succeed in whatever way that they understand as, uh, being successful. Uh, they also mentioned uh, not to have a boss anymore and being able to have their own timetable. So how all these factors did weight in your decision? Uh, um, I... I honestly felt like there was this nugget of a problem, which in the first instance is really this access to justice problem Mm -hmm. that I didn't think, I didn't have the sort of hubris to think I could solve the access to justice problem, but I thought I could do something that would improve. I had seen at the UN how, you know, a lot of smart people in a room couldn't solve a really tricky problem of effectively international law. But I, th- I saw that people on the ground were actually having an impact on people's lives. And I just thought in, in the context of getting something off the ground, I'm sure there is a way that we can increase the ability of people to access the legal system. And so it was, I thought about success more in terms of like, I'm obsessed with this idea of this problem and of having some sort of dent on it. And I think time boxing, it actually was quite useful because it meant that I sort of gave myself permission to really fail. Like if it doesn't work, if I can't do anything, I'll set a time around it and I'll be out. Mm-hmm. Great. Thank you, Julia. So um, then um, you, you were a lawyer, you decide to, to move to a business person and entrepreneur. So how was that transition? Was it uh, smooth? Uh, did, you felt, uh, did you feel lost at some point? Uh, what were your helps, your uh, so looking backwards, what, what, uh, maybe somebody, maybe some education, some training that you took? Um, um, I feel like, and, you know, highly encourage everyone to go to the, the University of Laws Business School, but I, I do feel like um, I, have had a, I have had a business school training by, by default in terms of, I, I, did, I haven't taken any professional or formal training. And the learning curve at the beginning was exceptionally steep. And I, I think at the beginning was probably much, much longer than people's beginning if, if they don't come from law or if they come from, from you know, a similar industry. But I interviewed someone a year or two ago and he'd been, at, he'd been a lawyer and then he'd been to Bain or, or one of these um, consultancies. And he said, and I I don't remember exactly which one, but he said they have a program to unlearn, to help you unlearn all of the traits that you have as being a lawyer. And I think some of the ones that I had that, you know, I'm still unlearning are, you know, there is a real sense law, you know, is naturally a risk averse profession. And I'm, I'm the one lawyer trait that I never really had is risk aversion. I'm like quite a risk hungry person, but a lot of the traits that I did have and that I still have and that I fight against are, you know, a a sort of drive to be of perfectionism and a sort of, uh, in its worst form, like being a pedant about, about, you know, a spelling mistake or something that's so minor. And so having to relearn these frameworks, not is this the best it can be, but like, is this the difference between success and failure? And that's the type of thing where I don't know that I don't know any other way to to learn that except for being knocked in the face by a bunch of failures when you're when you're building your business and and realizing actually X isn't important at all. And I, I've always learned my whole professional life that X is the, the goal and having to move away from that. So it's it's been a really steep learning curve, but um, I wouldn't go back. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Julia. So let, let's talk about the, the projects. Uh, I am particularly impressed with, with your idea about the crowdfunding uh, and uh, allowing this way the access to, to, to legal services, so people who couldn't afford that. So um, 
how did that idea, I mean, it's definitely your, your motivation and uh, you, you have mentioned before that in order to be an entrepreneur, clearly that that was one of the targets, just allowing people to, to have that access. So that's fine. Um, how do you think that crowdfunding uh, compared to other possibilities and uh, what are the pros and the cons for people wanting to use that service? Yeah, I think um, the crowdfunding, what crowdfunding does is it enables someone to tell a story and gain some sort of support. It can be financial support. It can be a kind of moral support. And I think what what always struck me about the law is that every every person's legal matter, whether it's super commercial or super personal, has a real story behind it. And there's a reason why someone's using using legal services, and that is um, that's something that people I think often you know at its at its sharpest edge people want to feel a sense of justice of vindication. At its more prosaic end, you know people just need legal advice sometimes. And so what crowdfunding can enable people to do is tell that story and it can enable them to do it in a way that helps them feel like they're getting that story out into the world. And at the same time, having people come behind them to support it is super meaningful. So often people are using, you know, the law at a time of, of deep personal distress and they might feel alone and vulnerable and having people around them is, is and people they might not even know, you know, strangers coming in to give, to give them support to get to um, court or to get to uh, an advisor, super, super valuable. So I think a lot of, um, a lot of alternative funding methods that exist are very, um, they're very poor in the sense that a lot of people um, have literally no option for funding. So they don't have savings. They don't have access to litigate, um, you know, traditional litigation funding. They don't have access to after the event insurance and, and a lot of, um, you know, a lot of legislative changes over the last few years have really reduced not only legal aid, but actually even more nuanced things that reduce people's ability, for example, to cover their adverse costs if they lose. So I think, I think crowdfunding really fills a gap. It doesn't, it's not a panacea and it can't give access to any, everybody, but it, it can give access to quite a lot of people. And it can also enable really important legal matters to go ahead that, that um, might not otherwise get to be heard. So one example is um, Stephen Hawking, um, um, and a, a group of academics funded a really important case um, on, on the privatization or the slide towards privatization of, of the NHS. And um, the, the judge in that case said, look, the public is funding the Secretary of State in this case, and the public, it's right that the public should also be funding these public spirited individuals who want to take a case in the public interest. So there's a lot of good that's come out of people being able to take important legal matters. And um, that's the, that sort of level at the, the kind of super public interest, high profile end to people who have a small employment issue and, um, and, and really can't afford to get a lawyer. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you. So uh, now we are at a moment when you have your ideas, you have your projects and you need to make it happen. So first decision, uh, you decided to do it alone. Uh, no funding, try to find a partner or uh, may I ask you why? Um, why, why I didn't find a co-founder? Uh, uh, well, yes, a co-founder or a partner for, for your venture. Yeah, so at the beginning, I really did think of it as a project. And I think right now, and, and maybe even at the time, but I was probably also just naive to it, there's a sort of cult of startups and entrepreneurship. And, and I, I wasn't that, what wasn't really my motivation, I wasn't really buying into that. And I, I, um, I didn't, therefore, sort of understand even the scope of, you know, the, what a co founder was, or why I would need one, or or why that was important. In retrospect, I, you know, I have a lot, <laughs> a lot of ideas about that, but at the time, none. And I really thought I, was, I had a project and I was gonna build it out and see what happened. And I think, um, you know, a lot of, I think a lot of business and a lot of probably any role is knowing what you, what you don't know. And at the beginning, I was so single-minded about this project that I actually really didn't know what I didn't know. 
And so that's again why the why the learning curve is so steep. But what I would have done potentially differently, although finding a co-founder is a bit like you know finding a partner in life. It's it's not something that is um, like a trivial undertaking that you just snap your fingers and you you have one. Um, but I I would have tried to find someone who compensated a lot more for the the weaknesses that I have um, uh, as a as a leader of a of a digital business. Mm-hmm. Great. So let, let's continue with the with the process now. So um, how did you uh, embark the first people to your project? Because uh, probably the the the, the first uh, the, the, they are key. I mean, they, they definitely need, need to be the support of all your project, and you need to have engaged people, people who really understand what you're aiming to do. It probably is very difficult to hire somebody uh, because they, they, they need to understand your, your your project and want to be a part of that. How you embark to the the, the the, the first uh, few uh, uh, members of your staff, really? Yeah, well, I mean, I think there's another aspect too, which is the first customers. And, and that's oh, almost a more interesting story because with the first members of staff, I actually didn't hire anyone until I raised some, raised some venture capital. And at the point where you raise venture capital, there is a kind of you know, there's a kind of aura around like a new startup that's just raised money. It's actually not that hard to hire. I think it's much harder. The hard thing is to hire, make a good hire. Um, but, but in terms of the first customers, that's actually much harder because you have no credibility. You have hardly any product. You're, you're just at that point anyway from, you know, where I was, it was just me. And I knocked on a lot of doors and heard a lot of people tell me that it was a really stupid idea. Um, and I, and then one, one law firm I talked to said, oh, we've been waiting for something like this to come along. And we have a case that's going to be on the front page of the Guardian in two weeks. Can you be ready to go? And I had like nothing. I had no product. I had, I, I'd been like tweeting from a new, <laughs> from a new Twitter account. And that somehow, you know, that was the public face of the company. I think we had a landing page with nothing. So um, that was, that was luck. I think that was luck that they were, that they were ready to take a bet on, on me and, and on this, you know, non-existent product. Well, I'm sure it was more than luck. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let's continue with that process. So you you, you got your your um, um, finances in place. Uh, you got your team, your customers. Uh, everything seems to be running, and uh, uh, you start planning expansion. Um, what are the risks, uh, the challenge that you found in growing, uh, and uh, the lessons learned really uh, in that process? Yeah, I mean, I think in a way at legal, um, the, 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 because, because of the way that we've evolved, I think legal actually represents a real understanding of growth and how to grow and what are the levers for growth. Because what we saw at Crowd Justice is all of the, all of the firms we're working with share a pain point. And at Crowd Justice, one of the interesting things is that everybody's pain point is quite different because everybody's approaching legal services for a different reason in a different way. They need a different amount of money. But when we looked at the lawyer piece, we could see, wait, actually, everyone, all law firms have cash flow problems. All law firms want to be able to serve their clients better. And we could actually serve those problems much more scalably and much more, um, much more going to the heart of, of what is um, in in a very networked industry, what is going to kind of spread like wildfire really quickly. So we launched legal on the 1st of October and we're, we have um, 70 law firms who are, um, who are clients in the first few months, which is something that I think we start to see the levers for growth working super, super fast in a way that in crowd justice has always been much more stop start, much more stop start. So, I mean, the main, the main takeaway for us was really focus on the pain point really, really narrowly, and then let that, you know, grow out, grow out from, from that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, um, I'm going to ask you now to, to use your crystal ball and tell me how do you see the future for legal tech, uh, particularly now in the new normal that is approaching us? Yeah, I mean, legal tech is a big, it's a big umbrella, right? So I think, um, 
I think there's a few different buckets and one is the direct to consumer bucket. So there's a lot of tech startups which are servicing consumers directly. They're disintermediating from law firms. And I think that is a super interesting trend to watch because fundamentally um, lawyers are so valuable for so many pieces of the legal world. And then there are really commoditized parts of, of law that, um, that consumers haven't necessarily been well served in to date. And I think post COVID, you know, we're seeing that accelerate with things like wills, for example. Then there's the part that we're operating in, which is how do you make law firms have the ability to work way more efficiently, way more digitally, give their clients a better experience and also not themselves lose out on the, the prize. And that's something that we're, I think we did see a real trend shifting that direction. A lot of um, more, a, a lot sort of healthier adoption by firms pre-COVID and post-COVID it's become less of a nice to have and more must have. And so certainly I would say that law firms adopting digital tools is um, is only going to accelerate. And I think fund, like there will be profound systemic changes to the legal industry of firms doing that because it means that there will be some firms that are winners because they just understand their business model better. They understand how they can deliver legal services better, faster, cheaper without necessarily um, losing their own margins and, and also whilst giving their clients like a much, much better experience. And I don't, you know, say that as an empty term. If, if you know, I'm sure lots and lots of, if not everyone on this call is a lawyer, but if you've ever instructed a lawyer, the idea of having to, you know, we have some, we've talked to some firms over the last months that are, um, you know, driving to see their clients to like look at an ID or something like that. And I think that's not a good experience for anybody involved. And that's on the extreme end, but there's a lot of kind of, um, there's a lot of uh, low hanging fruit to be had there. And then there's a, a final bucket, I think of um, at least one final bucket, but there's at least another bucket of like dramatic changes to the technology itself at the very like thin top end of the, of the technology space, which is around, you know, algorithmic decision making. It's around um, mass kind of collection of, um, of, of data and really good, good use of that data. Um, blockchain is like a very, you know, sexy term, but I think there's yet to be really powerful applications of that, but there will be. Um, so I think that's sort of how I see, um, that's how I see the, the market. And I think the fundamentally the law, the, the, the delivery of legal services will be much different, I think in 10 years, but it may well be 10 years and not, and not two. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I just have a last question and uh, I am now linking with uh, the questions for the audience. Please uh, feel free to type your questions and uh, somebody will pick them. Uh, I'm linking because uh, one of the persons and, and now uh, attending this uh, seminar is uh, talking about that, that in particular is asking you to uh, mention or to, to try to um, select in a way what three uh, advice would you give to a person who is uh, thinking about moving from law to entrepreneurship as you did? So yeah, yeah. Um, man, it's hard to it's hard to generalize because every lawyer is different, and um, there's certainly a lot of lawyers. I did I did commercial litigation, and I would say I wasn't I still wasn't like that commercial of a person, um, and um, I guess like the first the first thing I would say is. Um, really j just start like there's no there's no benefit to like over engineering over planning and like over worrying I think just start because like the, the more you're one of the one of the takeaways that I've had is I've had so much good advice over the last few years and you never really at least me personally I've never really understood the advice until it's like hit me in the face because I've like messed something up so I think you know the first thing is just to start um, two other things, I guess, um, yeah, depending on what kind of a lawyer you are and, and what kind of a, you know, per person you are, I would say, um, try to try, or at least the thing I wish someone had said to me is like really constantly, constantly, constantly focus on the things that are the difference between success and failure. And if you as the 
person running the company or, or getting it off the ground are thinking about anything other than that, you're probably thinking about the wrong thing. Um, and yeah, I guess, I mean, I would say that culture is something that is really important to me. And I think I haven't always been, you know, the best ambassador of culture because the environment that I came from, um, it wasn't necessarily privileged in the same way that, that it had I come from another non-legal environment, it would have been something that's like, you know, really, really focused on as a lever of success for the business really. And so, yeah, I think a focus on, really understanding culture and like, why do people want to work at your company? Why do, you know, why do they want to stay? Um, and embedding that in, because I think law, one of the things law fosters is like a real focus on climbing the ladder. And actually in the tech world and in the business world, um, pe like people don't want to just climb the ladder. Actually, they want a lot of different things and, and their ambitions are really important to hiring and retaining successful people. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Julia. Um, I have a question. Uh, you need to ask these things to an entrepreneur. It's probably in the job descriptor. Um, have you ever failed uh, at anything in this process? Uh, if so, how, how, do you, how did you deal with it, with, uh, with failure? Good. I fail probably every single day at something. Um, I think, well, I mean, from the macro, we expanded into the U.S. and I raised, um, I raised a venture capital round from like top U.S. investors. I was um, eight months pregnant. I thought that I I'd moved to the U.S. I moved my family to the U.S. You know, in a month, um, and thought like, wow, we are gonna have to crack the U.S. and this is so exciting and we're like the best startup in the world, and then like massively failed, as in. Um, kind of had to say seven or eight months in thought mm, this isn't I don't think this is going to work um, and of course the company's failure every failure is, is fundamentally my failure and um, so really didn't know what to do you know in terms of um, do you give money back to people what you know do you shut the whole thing down and I realized that there was you know we could shut the US down and, and move back to the UK. We still had retained a small office in the UK and it was working really well. Um, and so that's like on a macro level, you know, I, I moved my whole family to the US for a year and for, for a failed subsidiary. Um, on, on a micro level, you know, every single day I probably learn one thing, something I should have done differently. Um, and that ranges from like, you know, hiring the wrong person because I didn't ask the right questions and I didn't think about the future three steps ahead to, um, you know, uh, misunderstanding something that our customer said and, and taking a decision based on a misunderstanding. And so it's, you know, from the macro to the micro every single day. And I think embracing that is like 100% important to not, um, to not sort of, getting um I, I think that's the really the only important thing in a way is learning how to embrace that and be resilient because sometimes it's like super hard so how do I deal with it like most days I'm like oh that was a good learning and some days I like cry <laughs> just depends <laughs> Um, following the questions, um, this may be jumping to a completely different scene, but uh, uh, this is a very, very focused uh, question. Uh, um, in order to gain access to the legal tech industry, do you need knowledge of uh, software development or you don't need it? Did you have any knowledge of software development when you decided to jump over there? No, none, none. And I think what I would say is when you ask, you know, about a co-founder, I think it would have... Um, it would have really accelerated some of the learning curve to have someone who is super close to me and to the and like super passionate about the business who really could bring that expertise because I, I still now am not, you know, I am certainly not a technical founder. I've, I've picked up a, a whole host of knowledge, but I'm one of the least technical people on our team. and. I now can compensate for that because I know what good looks like in terms of a hire who can who does know that. But at the beginning, it's quite hard because you don't really know what good looks like in the person that has that knowledge. So that's actually one of the things that that is important to compensate for at the beginning, I think, and and try and get external validation of the people you're bringing in in a technical capacity. 
Great. Thank you. So uh, I have another question. Uh, somebody uh, wants you to elaborate on something that you, you said before. You mentioned that you realize that you need to have more confidence in your idea after seeing your mind be super confident with the more inferior idea. So kind of, uh, do you think that this, this was a wake up call for you? Uh, do you think that that's a common issue that uh, women face? Do you know, I mean, I think it is, um... I definitely think that there is a gendered like issue with confidence, but I think to be totally honest with you, confidence is not something that I've typically lacked. And I think the thing that was a trigger for me in that, in, in this moment of starting was actually, I couldn't just take what people said when I was showing them the product and they were like, or like my, not the product, my really bad sketches of what a product might look like. And they were like, this is a terrible idea. I think it was not so much that I lacked confidence in myself. It was that I didn't feel confident to sell a product that didn't exist yet, kind of because fundamentally I'm only good. And, and actually many salespeople are only really good at selling something that is like an amazing product. And so even now, like when I fundraise and fundraising is fundamentally a sale, I, I can't fundraise if I don't really believe the story. And a lot of people can. And I think there's a lot of smoke and mirrors in the startup world because there's a lot of people who, I, I don't know if you call it confidence or bluster or what, but like, I think you do need real confidence to be a founder and it has to be like genuine confidence. You can't fake it. But I think the, the important thing with getting something off the ground is this funny balance between having total confidence it can work, but also accepting the feedback that can help you improve the idea or the product. So it's like a super weird balancing act between like, of course this will succeed. And if they can give you feedback, that's a bit negative, but that's also going to help you improve it. Thinking like, oh yes, I will also take that on board. Um, I do think like I, you know, I've spoken to groups of, um, um, you know, younger women who are maybe thinking of a tech career. And I do notice like a lot of lack of confidence. And I'm really curious about where that comes from or how that's fostered, because ultimately that's really depressing. And, and I, don't, I don't know how to fix that. You know, I, I don't know how people can fix that as they're going through an education system, but you have to have like real confidence for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, I have another question. Um, may I try to formulate it this way because I have a couple of them. Uh, so what's for you uh, trying to find a balance between your business and your uh, home life? Uh, how you can handle that uh, while you are launching at the same time so many amazing projects and how do you manage that? Yeah, I mean, um, one, I have an amazing um, child care. So like I pay a lot of money to have a lot of child care. So that's a fact. And, and um, that's, I, I don't think it would be possible without it. Um, second, I have like a really amazing partner. And so we, you know, we, we share things. Um, he runs a business as well. We share things as much as we can. And third, um, I actually, I found a balance that, that really works for me. And what that means is like, I actually don't know what, at the beginning, if I replay it at the very beginning, I didn't have kids and I really worked 18 hour days. I worked seven days a week and I don't know in retrospect, if I could have done it with kids, because now I, you know, I love, I mean, now we're remote, but I leave the office when we were in the office at five thirty or six, I go home, I put my kids to bed. I log back in in the evenings when I need to, but actually I found that like often I don't really need to and I can find a balance because I ruthlessly prioritize. I take things out of my diary that I don't need to be doing. I try not to micromanage wherever, you know, bad practice in general, but like super bad practice if you've got like a whole lot of other things going on. I don't work on weekends um, unless I really have to. I am on holiday right now. Um, and I did do, you know, two hours of interviews for candidates before this call because um, I thought I'll time box three hours of my holiday on a Monday and I'll just do that. So I found a balance that works for me. And I see one of the questions is like, do you feel guilty about it? And like, absolutely not, because I really like my job. I really love my kids. And um, I think they'll be really proud that they have someone in their life as their mother who you know, has done something that, that she loves. And, and I think that comes through to them. I hope they're little, they're still little. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I have another question. Uh, uh, this is clearly a concern for many. Um, do you believe the, 
the predictions of uh, widespread job losses, as, uh, in particular for paralegals or people working on certain scales of the legal profession, uh, as a result of the increasing uh, use of uh, legal tech, uh, do you think that's exaggerated uh, or definitely there will be a challenge for some roles? I think there's always going to be a need for good legal advice. And I think that's true across the market. So I think that's true at the, you know, there's a lot of um, Richard Susskind-esque um, kind of um, crystal ball holders and often they're right. But I think this idea that at the top of, you know, only really niche legal advice is going to be valuable. I don't buy, I don't buy into that premise particularly. I think people need legal services for a couple of reasons. And one is for technical legal skill. And one is because sometimes people really like talking to a human being. I think there is gonna be a lot of legal services that can be disintermediated when they are super commoditized. But one of the reasons that AI hasn't, in my personal opinion, really found a lot of application in the law yet is because there's, um, there's often um, complexity that can't be, that can't necessarily yet at least be be really um, changed in, in a way that, that machine learning or, or AI can really accommodate yet. And I think um, I think that will evolve and I think that will change. And I think, you know, we are living in a time of like rapid and exciting technological change. So I guess what I would say is broadly speaking, I think the fears are a bit overblown, but I would also say that you know, if you can develop skills that are super commercial and or super relevant to whatever sphere of law you're in and potentially think about the world as a broad place where there are lots of jobs and lots of them are very interesting and lots of them have legal application, it will, you know, it will seem less, you know, it, it potentially could be, especially when you talk about paralegals. I think if you're at the sort of senior to mid level of your career, you've got lots of, you know, there's huge amounts of um, time and, and change that can be, you know, that's coming that, that can be evolved to. But I think at the paralegal level, you know, be open to the fact there's a lot of careers out there and, and many of them may be um, riding that wave of innovation rather than necessarily worrying about it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, I think I'm going to mix uh, together uh, two questions. One that I, we've got from one of our lecturers who sent it beforehand uh, this afternoon and one from a member of our audience. Uh, so what barriers have you experienced in getting lawyers to engage with new legal technology and how you have overcome this? And uh, this links with another question that we have from our audience uh, asking if the legal system in, in America in particular, they are more open to digitalization illegal practice so in terms of the adoption question the what i what we see at legal as a as a pretty clear pattern is that the buyers of technology are often not lawyers they might be um tech and finance teams they might be compliance and procurement teams they tend not to be lawyers and i suspect there's quite a lot of like internal and and you know we hear directly from them there can be quite a lot of like internal um uh, selling that has to go on from those kind of commercial level teams to the legal teams. What we're doing specifically, which I think makes that question less applicable than in um, some other parts of the legal technology ecosystem, is that we try and build tools like the, so the suite of tools that we have is um, it essentially tries to just digitize really manual, horrible processes that firms have now. So actually the finance teams like love us that we have all of these testimonials because one of the things that we're doing is actually taking away non-chargeable like non-chargeable time and just digitizing their existing processes. So it, it actually doesn't, there's no like fighting against it necessarily in the same way that um, I, I think you do see in other applications. Um, but there is certainly, we do sometimes hear like finance or IT teams. Um, uh, there's some snarky comments sometimes to us um, about the kind of managing partnership level at their firms, which might be slower to adopt. Um, even when it's like commercially beneficial for them to adopt when it will massively change like their cash flow position, for example, or like the time it takes them to onboard new client. And so there's like no 
there, there's the ROI is very clear. Um, still, they can have some pushback themselves internally, and that's that's been really interesting. Um, I saw something on LinkedIn today, actually, that was um, someone saying that their eight-year-old niece only uses, has never heard of Microsoft Word and has never heard of PowerPoint, but is constantly doing things in Google Docs. And whether the next generation of, of lawyers will be impossible to get them to use Microsoft Word rather than like to stop using Microsoft Word. And the only other thing I would note is we have to build, because you have to, every product you build have, has to work on like multiple devices, but also multiple internet browsers. And um, our engineering teams, like the biggest bane of their life is building for Internet Explorer 11 because like nobody uses that. It's like a very, very degraded technology, but lawyers use it. And so it's the thing that causes like, it adds probably 30% to every single thing we build is is having to accommodate IE 11. Um, so that's just one, that like that's one example, I guess, of not of adoption, but of, um, well, kind of of adoption. Mm -hmm. um, and then the US system, I'm American, but I, um, apart from our failed foray into the U.S., um, I, I actually haven't ever worked in the U.S. legal system. I don't know it very well. And um, I think one of the learnings that we had there was that it's because it's such a big, there's 450,000 lawyers in the U.S., so there's like an, a kind of correlating um, amount of diversity in terms of like how tech literate people are and that can make it like quite a difficult market to sell into because it's um, the long tail of sort of small practices is so long. Mm -hmm. uh, probably connected with this uh, last question, uh, there's somebody asking you to take your crystal ball again and uh, is curious about um, what areas of the legal system you see in the future becoming uh, app-based more easily? Oh, that's interesting. I mean, I think um, that's something that, um, I mean, the obvious answer that comes right to mind is the DTC, the direct to consumer kind of like, um, companies that are just going right to consumer. I think um, I think that's the clear one. In terms of, I, I see that there's a lot of potential for app-based, bo both like mobile app, but also like web app-based products, um, including things like, um, there's so much data that is becoming, as, as court systems are starting to have APIs, as, I just think there's going to be so much searchability and so much, um, so many applications that build off of that, that we might be able to see things that we haven't thought about yet because that data is not really yet um, uh, fully available, but it is starting to become so. And I, I think that will change a lot in the way that people think about legal services, access them, build applications off, off of, uh, on the top of that. Thank you. Uh, there's also another question that I think is interesting from one of our um, uh, lecturers. Uh, um, with increasing concern about the access to justice and legal aid cuts, uh, the aims of crowd justice are commendable, definitely. Uh, however, there are concerns that the reach of technology can be limiting due to lock lack of digital literacy and access to technology. So maybe the people who really need the service are not literate enough in, in new technologies and they're really not aware that their services is really provided. Uh, has thing, this been reflected in the uptake of the crowd justice? Has uh, crowd justice had the reach that you hoped it would have? One of the limiting factors that we intentionally put on crowd justice is that you had to have either instructed a lawyer or have a lawyer agree to act should you raise the funds. And the reason that we have that threshold is because it gives us the kind of quality assurance threshold that someone's not just saying, I think I have a case and I need 50,000 pounds or whatever. And that is limiting in a couple of ways. It means that um, very vulnerable people who might not uh, even know where to start looking for a lawyer probably don't even come to us. We or, or they come to us and we say, we, you know, c c think about, you know, finding a lawyer first. Um, it also means that law firms who have very vulnerable clients, and there's many of them, um, might not, they, they might themselves filter those clients out as not being suitable for crowdfunding, even though what we find is that um, 
not in all cases, but in most cases, even reasonably vulnerable people can can use the tool because they can leverage, you know, communities or contacts or networks to do the the kind of legwork effectively for them, um, charities, etc. So it's not a panacea. And certainly, you know, if someone doesn't have access to the internet and they don't speak English and uh, which we have, you know, we've had um, people like that approach us or, or people who are in contact with people like that approach us. Um, it, it can be ch challenging, but at the same time, um, you know, it does fill a need that um, is not usually addressed elsewhere in the funding kind of ecosystem. So I think absolutely technology in general can have, um, can be exclusionary. Um, I think with crowd justice, I think about it actually less from like a pure sort of technology perspective and more, can you access like a network? Can you access the internet? Um, and that's maybe less, you know, obviously the internet's important, but it's not that much different than if you are vulnerable and, you know, you wouldn't have um, necessarily anyone to, to help you spread the word offline either. So I think just in the way that um, infrastructure, like social infrastructure makes life very difficult for people who are very vulnerable. Technology can exacerbate that to some extent, but I don't think it's like necessarily the root of the problem. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there's also another question about this in particular. Uh, somebody has seen uh, news about crowd justice in lots of different press and the Financial Times and the legal. Uh, did the news about crowd justice spread organically? I mean, it's such a powerful story that uh, probably you don't need to push that too much, or definitely there's a lot of work in that, just trying to pitch these organizations and uh, try to get them half this. Yeah, I think, to be honest, it's been mostly, if not exclusively organic. We've never used a PR person. Um, in fact, I got a friend who does PR to teach me before it launched how to write a press release um and how to pitch so i wrote like a hundred emails the day we launched and was like delighted and also not remotely surprised which in retrospect was extremely <laughs> extremely naive to get pre we got lots of press when we launched and it was literally because the day before i'd written to a bunch of journalists and just expected them to write something about it um but i think fundamentally journalists lack access to good legal stories um because people don't know you know they don't know who to go to 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 tell their story and and if they do try and tell it their lawyer often you know pushes back so yeah we we um we're also doing something reasonably innovative in a um in a funding landscape that hasn't seen like a ton of innovation so i think there's like a lot of angles there but um journalists are hungry for interesting content and i think you know the site has a lot of interesting stories on it mm -hmm. Well, I think that we still have a time for one last question. Um, uh, there has been a lot of concern about the ethics and technology, and uh, in particular, uh, how technology is designed and the use of algorithms. Uh, but uh, are there any ethical considerations and safeguards uh, that you have taken uh, into account when you have developed uh, legal? Um, yeah, I mean, legal is, um, you know, when I mentioned the sort of buckets of, of technology, l legal, there's an aspect of um, automated decision making because we're automating things like compliance. But fundamentally, the decision making rests with the, the law firm. And it, I think where, where algorithms in technology and, um, and the justice system become, you know, really gray areas around ethics are not so much in these tools that these SaaS tools that we provide to law firms to help them run their businesses more efficiently. I think it's much more in the area when you're having courts make decisions, when you're having landlords make decisions, when you're essentially having people say yes, no, or wrong, right about, about a topic or a person or subject. Or as far as we're surfacing, um, we're surfacing information to law firms and we're, we're creating um, the ability for clients to go through a really streamlined process. So I think ethics come into it a little bit, a little bit um, less aggressively than they do when you're thinking about, you know, should the, should the criminal justice system have um, probation decisions in the US? I know that's a, a really hot topic, um, be decided by algorithms. Um, should you have, you know, in lots of different industries, these problems are coming to the fore. And I think, um, 
I think uh, there's huge, huge um, work to be done to make sure that um, the underlying the, the underlying decision making that's happening, so the algorithm itself is um, is not or as to the extent possible not biased and I think that's really really hard and um, there's actually a great podcast on this um, on on uh, how I built it that uh, this this woman Vivian Sung um, has phenomenal phenomenal insights on this and I, I think I mean many people do but but I recommend listening if, if you haven't. Thank you very much, uh, Julia. I think that we are nearly uh, on time. So uh, I, I can confirm that the two words uh, more often used in the chat has been thank you. So <laughs> that's what I want uh, to thank you uh, on behalf of the University of Law and in particular the Business School. It's been an amazing conversation with you. We have enjoyed very much. I really look forward to having you again in these uh, events or any others. Uh, and uh, I don't know if um, you want to say last few words and then Maria close. Yeah, no, on my part, I'm um, really, as I mentioned, so grateful to be here. And um, yeah, I do just encourage, you know, anyone who's who's thinking about making the jump from law to entrepreneurship to, you know, feel free to reach out or or um, or just, just do it. <laughs> Thank you, Julia. So Maria? Thank you, Julia, and thank you, everybody, for attending. Julia, enjoy your holiday. You must be exhausted after yeah. several hours of interviewing before this session. So huge thank you again, and thanks for everybody to attending tonight. Thank you. Okay. Have a great evening. Goodbye. Bye-bye.